All right, so I thought what I would do is record, do the screen capture um, recording of some of this lecture so you guys could watch it later and see if that helps you. Uh, so chapter six, uh, we are talking about uh, energy, right? So um, and we'll talk about enzymes, and we'll talk about different forms of energy and things like that. Um, but energy is essentially right, the ability to promote change or do work. Right? And so uh, whether that's, you know, maybe promoting you to do a little bit more work so you can do better on exams, or maybe that's um, doing work so a machine can pick up a large object or whatever. Right? And so essentially, energy comes in two forms. Right? It comes in uh, kin a kinetic form, right? which is um, usually people talk about kinetic energy as the energy of motion. Right? And then potential energy, um, a lot of times people talk about as uh, energy at rest. Um, we can also have other forms of energy like chemical energy. So usually when we talk about things like ATP in biology, then we're talking about uh, chemical energy. And so one easy way to think about maybe kinetic energy um, is, so if you play baseball, I mean, so um, actually hitting, take, taking the bat, Right, and swing, swinging the bat, right? That is kinetic energy. Uh, and then you put that energy into the ball and then hopefully uh, the ball goes a long way. Uh, potential energy, um, here the potential energy would be stored in the bowstring. So as she pulls it back, she takes that, uh, well you could think about chemical energy really from, really from the ATP, right, from her muscles. Right, when she pulls that back, she stores that energy into the bowstring, and then when she releases it, um, it turns into kinetic energy that is then um, released into the arrow itself. Um, so, again, kinetic energy, energy of motion, potential energy is energy that is stored. Um, when we look at laws of thermodynamics. Uh, so essentially what the first law of thermodynamics says is it's the law of conservation of energy, right? So energy cannot, right, and it's very important, so energy cannot be created or destroyed. Um, it can change forms, uh, but that's it. So if you, in any system, uh, if you have uh, X amount of energy when you start, uh, when you finish whatever reaction you're going through, you're gonna have X amount of energy. Um, just would be could be in different forms right so you cannot create nor destroy energy it can only be transformed and so maybe an example of that would be like this so you have this large uh, dam um, and all of this water back here right so all of this is potential energy essentially right so it's energy there's energy in that system right there's energy in this water uh, it's just all stored here behind the dam. Um, it's not until the water comes through the dam right, that maybe it turns some turbine in here, and then you have mechanical energy, right? So the movement of the water through the dam, that's mechanical energy, will turn some turbine um, and then causes a generator to produce uh, some electricity, right? So you get mechanical energy there turned in to electrical energy uh, and then that electrical energy is sent um, if you can see these very well but it's sent along some transmission lines uh, that eventually reach your house and you can turn your lights on um, so all the energy is still there right so from the water behind the dam as it comes through um, the same amount of energy it's all still there it's just transferred uh, into different forms the second law of thermodynamics uh, essentially says um, that the transfer of energy from from one form to another will increase its entropy or disorder in a system. So as entropy increases, less energy is available to do work. Uh, and again, this is all something that uh, until we put it in terms like this, it, it makes sense if you think about it. So if I don't put energy into any system, 
that system tends toward disorder. All right, so don't put any energy uh, into cleaning your house or your room or your office or dishes or whatever. Don't put energy, any energy into that. Um, and you pretty quickly see that those systems will tend towards disorder. How do you organize them back? Well, you put energy back into those systems so that then you put things away. You wash your clothes, you clean the dishes, you reorganize your house. And then in that sense, order is restored to the system. So one of the ways your book shows this is here's a highly ordered system. Uh, if you left that system <clears throat> alone and did nothing to it and you put no energy back into it, then that would that system would tend towards <clears throat> disorder. Right. Um, now, some people will tell you that um, the earth itself violates this second law, right? Because we have very highly ordered systems on earth. In fact, human bodies are very highly ordered systems. So how does that happen? Well, if you know anything about the earth, right, we get a huge influx of energy from this big yellow thing right, we call the sun. Right? And so that energy is constantly coming down, bombarding the planet right, with lots and lots of energy. Uh, and then we consume that energy, at least, um, so that actually that sun is captured, that sun energy is captured in the leaves of plants. Right. Um, and then some critter comes along and eats <clears throat> that plant um, and then transforms that energy into other energy that they use maybe to build muscles or whatever. And so we've got this constant kind of influx of energy that helps us maintain these highly ordered systems uh, on Earth. If the sun goes out, though, and we don't continue to get this influx of energy from the sun, then this system, right, which is Earth, will go to more disorder. Right? That's just the way physics works. It's the way, it, way it'll happen eventually. And so if we look at all the different types <coughs> of energies, right, so we've got uh, light energy, which we get some of that from the sun. We get heat energy from the sun. Uh, mechanical energy um, would be, again, like uh, water moving through a dam. Right? So the actual motion there uh, is a form of energy. Uh, chemical potential energy would be, again, something that's very important in biology anyway, this, ATP. Right? So that's uh, chemical energy. Something else we can get is um, electrical or ion uh, gradients. So <clears throat> I've talked a lot, especially when I talked about uh, membranes, right? So if you have uh, a membrane, right? Remember across that membrane, you can have, maybe you can have a bunch of positive ions on this side, a bunch of negative ions on that side, right? That's an ion gradient, right? That's, um, that's essentially energy. Right, you can use that energy then to do work. So that's much like a battery. Right, if if um, maybe if I put if I pump some some a bunch of positives on one side, a bunch of negatives on the other, inherently <clears throat> they're going to want to go to the other side. So I can put something like a protein here uh, or a channel here, um, and every time I move one of these positive charges through, I can create some ATP. Uh, from that. And we'll spend some time talking about that. That's essentially cellular respiration, uh, and we'll spend some time talking about that uh, in the coming chapters. <clears throat> so when we look at all of these uh, different types of energies, um, we can essentially look at the total energy in a system. Right? So how much total energy is in a system. Right? And so to figure that out, we could look at how much usable energy is there and how much unusable energy is there. 
Um, almost no system is 100% efficient, so you have a certain amount of energy that you can use and a certain amount that you can't. Uh, gasoline engines, for instance, there's a certain amount of energy you're going to get from the gasoline that will propel your car forward, which would be mechanical energy, uh, and there's other energy that you're going to lose through heat, uh, and your car is not really going to use that energy. Um, but again, however much energy was in the gasoline to start with, the total energy, it's all still there, it's just in a different form. Right, so the energy transforms, right, and, and of course, uh, entropy is increased. Right, and so we can look at things like uh, free energy. So we usually call that G, um, and oftentimes we talk about delta G, right, which is delta for the change in free energy. Right, and that's the energy to do work, uh, or Gibbs free energy. And so if we look at that in uh, kind of a, uh, an equation form, right? so what this says is total energy um, in a system must equal the free energy right? plus the entropy, right? so the unused energy, times the temperature in Kelvin. Um, and if we rework that a little bit, you can get an equation that looks something like this. Right, so if we're talking about changes in free energies right, and whether um, reactions are spontaneous or not. Right, and so if we look at the, the change in free energy in a system, right, so if, and again let's go back See what we're talking about here. Right? So remember, H is total energy, right? S is entropy. So if the free energy right, minus the entropy Right, times the temperature, right? if that number is negative, right, so right here, right, if that number is negative, then that means that reaction is spontaneous or exergonic. Right. If that number happens to be positive, uh, then that reaction is not spontaneous and it is endergonic. Right, now, <clears throat> I'm not going to ask you to calculate things like this on an exam. Uh, but it is kind of uh, good for you to see some of this to think about um, what it means or how we drive chemical reactions in living systems. And so um, I say all that to kind of build here. Right? If we look at something like um, ATP, right? so this is adenosine triphosphate. And again, I've drawn this on the board for you a bunch of times. Um, all adenosine triphosphate is is essentially an adenine over here with three phosphates bound to it. Um, in an aquatic system like we are essentially, uh, you break one of those phosphate bonds. Um, the breaking of that bond gives you negative 7.3 kilocalories per mole and so that is a spontaneous uh, reaction. Right? So this reaction then favors the formation of the products. Right? All that means is it's exergonic, uh, it's spontaneous, uh, and you liberate energy from that system. So who cares? Well, we talk about often uh, ATP being essentially the energy molecule uh, in systems. And you have to have ATP in order to drive other reactions. Right? So when I look at something like this, right? so I know this all looks very confusing, but if I take something like glucose, right? So glucose is C6H12O6. Uh, when I take that, uh, in certain, when we talk about respiration, we'll talk about needing to put some phosphate onto glucose. Right? And when you do that, you get this molecule called glucose 6 phosphate uh, and you release some H2O in there. Right? When you do that, that reaction uh, gives you a positive delta G, right? So it is an endergonic reaction, you have to put energy into it to make it happen. Right? Well, where does that energy come from? 
Well, again, if we think back, right, if I have ATP in some water, right, I can break that down into ADP plus a little bit of phosphate. Right? That reaction is exergonic. Right? It happens spontaneously. Right? And that reaction gives you negative 7.3 kilocalories per mole. Right? Well, what happens if I was to put those together? Right? So, remember, glucose plus um, ATP, right? or, so we haven't talked about this yet, so you can't remember it, but glucose plus ATP uh, will give us some glucose 6-phosphate plus a little ADP. Right? And essentially all that is, uh, let me change colors here just to kind of emphasize that. Right? All that is is taking these two things right, and adding them together. Right? So that essentially if I have minus 7.3 plus 3.3, uh, that gives me negative 4. Right? And so this whole reaction, right, all of this reaction, will happen spontaneously right, because together right, it's still a negative delta G. Right? <clears throat> and so that's why ATP drives a lot of reactions right, because it has such a low Right, and that minus 7.3, it has such a, uh, a low or such a negative delta G uh, that it can do that. It drives a lot of reactions. And uh, we can have lots of ATP or we produce a lot of ATP from uh, glucose molecules.